This is Mike Wood. He joined the Baltimore Police Department in 2003 when he was 24, but retired last year with a shoulder injury, disillusioned and feeling as if he was hurting the people of Baltimore more than helping them. He's a friendly, outgoing, and charismatic guy. I shouldn't have been surprised since over the past month, he's gotten a lot of practice at being camera ready. After going on a Twitter rant in which he revealed a series of awful things that he saw his fellow officers do while on the job, he has become the go-to dissident in the law enforcement community for journalists everywhere, an informed critic with an inside view of a culture that has come under unprecedented scrutiny over the past year. For all the talking Mike has done since going public with his stories, I didn't feel like I had a clear understanding of what being a police officer in Baltimore was actually like for him what the job had demanded, and how the culture of the Thin Blue Line had affected his thinking about the role of cops in the lives of Baltimore's least fortunate, most vulnerable residents. With a notebook full of questions, I headed down there and asked Mike to give me a tour of his old stomping grounds. Can you just ride a red light? Yeah, that happens. <laughs> There's nobody here. We drove through his different posts, starting with the Baltimore Police Academy, the place where new recruits go to train before they're sent out into the street. You guys can see what it is. It's a refurbished... Uh, abandoned school it's disgusting on the inside like that's one thing that gets lost a lot is how the officers are actually treated in Baltimore and they are not treated good like the Eastern District where I was would have literally sinks hanging off the wall he told me story after story that would leave anyone dumbfounded and angry the officer comes around the corner and just boots him in the face as hard as he can. He just turns and just smacks her, like, open God out, and you know, threw the guy off the bike, picked up the guy's shoes, threw the guy's shoes onto the roof. I had heard about some of this stuff already from Mike's Twitter feed. What I really wanted to understand was why it happened. How does this culture of contempt and violence towards black people take hold in a police department like Baltimore's? And how is it perpetuated, even after an entire year of police scandals being in the headlines? For a while when you're in field training, you're still technically a trainee. Which I could have been fired at any moment for the first year, you can get fired for any, at anything. You're just in pencil. It, it was during that time period where, like, even if I would have spoken up, somebody could have just been like, well, you're fired, see you later. You can't, like, when you're in that probationary stage, you can't upset the apple cart at all. You're going to be gone if you do. Could you just describe sort of what you learned about police culture during those early days? Yeah, you don't learn about it. Um, you hear the past stories and you see... When a cop does something wrong, you see the unions and you see the politicians stand up for the officer. You don't see anyone stand up for, for the, the citizen. They just become a statistic, a number that you're going after. That us versus them attitude, I mean, I, I understand how it is reinforced by you know, the rhetoric that comes out of police unions, for example. How does it manifest itself in interactions that police have with, with people like on a daily basis? Right. Not so that's, that's even a misnomer in itself, that you walk the beat and talk to citizens. Okay. So no one does that. I would try to be friendly with people, but really the reality is, is if I spent an hour talking to a citizen, that was an hour that everyone viewed I should have been out getting statistics. And what were those statistics that you so, should have been hitting? So normally it's, it's drugs, and that's your main focus, is drugs or part one crimes, which would generally be felonies that have a significant jail time. And guns, which is a misdemeanor, but that, that's a big thing here. So that's everything. Like, like there is no walking and talking to the community. That's what you do in policing. You're trying to do what keeps you out of trouble from all of the problems that are internal. Like, I never feared the streets, but I constantly feared other officers. So how has the, the climate sort of in, in the city uh, shifted since Freddie Gray was killed and the riots happened? I mean, these people that we just passed, like, are they, uh, do they live in fear of police? They live across the street from where what, Freddie Gray was killed. Right, so what they fear is that we can get away with whatever we choose to get away with. The laws are to the point where anybody can be locked up pretty much for any time. Like one of the cases I did uh, in, in uh, the Senate in Maryland that I, I testified to was how you can't actually drive a car legally. I mean, it would be impossible. No one can get this car from here to the end of the street completely legally. So an officer can arrest you at any moment? At any point in time. So you're constantly ready to be a problem. Do you want to go back to uh, the story you were telling before? So you got you, you were called on the, on the radio for, for backup. I hear the call and I'm not too far away from where we are right now. I'm in a position to head off the guy that's running. 
I get out of my car, get into a nice place, and corner the guy in an alley. He, you know, he turns and sees me. We have a little bit of struggle. I put him. On, we get on the ground. He gets the handcuffs on. And all in all, this is just like a passively resisting arrest. I, I no cop should ever be upset when a suspect passively resists being taken to jail. That's what you should expect. And I got got him down with the handcuffs and the officer turned the corner to the alley and just kicked him in the face as hard as he could, it seemed to be, because his face swelled up instantly. He had a nice black eye, it was a contusion. Why does he do that? What is the kick for? All right, so I'm guessing, but my guess is that he's pissed off that he lost the foot chase. Mm -hmm. I mean, would I be pissed off if I lost the foot chase? Yeah, I've lost foot chases. It pisses you off. So, I mean, everyone everyone gets angry in their jobs, right? <laughs> yeah, can you imagine if the cashier got mad that you know, she rung up the thing wrong and decided to punch the customer in the face? The key thing to understand, Mike told me, is that in many cases, the officers who treat people like that are doing so because they're afraid. I have always thought that those are the ones that actually cross the line more, is the ones that are afraid. And that's our standard in policing, is fear. So you if mean? you're afraid, you can do whatever you want. That's the legal standard. Oh. So if I am afraid that you can take my life, then I'm allowed to take yours, right. legally. Where does the fear come from then? Like in the, in the guys that do have the fear, it sounds like you think that a lot of them, or most of them do. The pussies. I'm not afraid to say it. They were the people that were afraid before they came in. And just because you got a badge and a gun doesn't suddenly mean you're not afraid. I, I don't think most people real, like think of police officers as being afraid, as being primarily afraid. Deathly afraid. There's cops that won't get out of their car when there's a fight with a guy and another officer. To some extent, they're taught to be afraid, right? That we were, you know, those yeah, yeah. they've shown videos in which guys who, who, who hesitate, you know, a second too long are, are, are blown away by, by some madman in the street. Yeah, I, th I think you're completely right. I mean, that is actually what they show you. They show you the videos. There's an infamous one of a cop who is getting shot at and actually just seems afraid to pull the trigger at, at another human being. Like, like, like the guy was so empathetic that he couldn't, even though he was going to lose his life, he like couldn't bring himself to kill another human being. And that's a video they show all the time. Fear, Mike said, has a nasty tendency to turn into a kind of constant low-level anger. What feels sort of within the bounds of acceptable behavior in Baltimore, at least during the time when you were on, on the job, uh, to do with your anger? Yeah, I mean, that's, they don't have much of a release. So I think it, a lot of it gets built up in, in like bitterness of, of the people and of the environment not in a productive way. Like they generally don't go and work out, they don't deflate themselves. Instead, they'll get angry at the citizens, give further into that us versus them, and you know, start their infamous drinking problems uh, that, that you hear about with police. You know, that's real because it is a stressful thing. So officers are ambiently angry and afraid for their lives at every turn. And the people they're supposed to be serving are afraid and defensive about the possibility of being hassled by a surly cop and curted off to jail for no reason. What Mike is describing is a vicious cycle, and while he's not the first guy in the world to characterize it as such, I wondered if he had any thoughts on how it might be broken. If we actually did a community policing model designed to have decentralized power so that the patrol officer can take care of things in his, or his or her responsibility area. So, in a true community policing model, if I came down here and I see this overgrown brush, I have the power and the resources to get city workers or something like that down here to fix that. I should have the ability to get weed whackers and recruit people in the neighborhood and maybe for that day of work instead of locking people up, I came out with the neighborhood and did this because that would have some kind of improvement overall. Driving through the utterly dilapidated Sandtown neighborhood, looking at the memorial that has been erected in honor of Freddie Gray. It strikes me that clearing out an overgrown bush feels like pretty small potatoes. Plus, while community policing seems like an obviously good idea in principle, it's my sense that it usually ends up being little more than a buzzword in practice, that police culture inevitably overwhelms it. 
Well, that's the thing, though. I mean, I think culture, like, is the transmission of values, like, from one person to another. I don't know if, if it goes laterally or if it goes from, like, the, you know, from the top down in terms of rank. Uh, you know, you do as your commander or your, your, your captain says, and you think the way he thinks. Um, but it has to, I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's what I'm asking. Like, is, is there, a, is there a, a path along which change can kind of travel? What we have to do is we have to start thinking about what are we actually doing and what are our goals? So if our goals are to reduce violent crime, we have to change our metrics. So right now our metric is arrest. That's what judges and officers. So who's in charge of these metrics? It's command and it's, it's politicians. So we have to change the metric to crime reduction, to justice, to problem solving. So that would be a continual metric where you would always have something to do, where you would always improve the community because you should be focused on improving your post, not on locking up many of those people up on your post. Because if you're taking their freedom away, how are you not going to be their enemy? To close out our tour, Mike took me to a part of Baltimore that was very different from everything we'd seen so far. A white neighborhood on the north side of town. It's where he was transferred after about four years on the force. He found the contrast astonishing. He also found it difficult to make his numbers because all of a sudden he didn't have anyone to arrest. His solution? Drive two blocks away into a part of town where he could easily find young black men. So who would you arrest here? For what? It seems like you need a reason. You were saying earlier that But you arbitrary. don't! That's the thing you're not understanding. So like they were in the street. Uh huh. That's, That's it? enough. That's enough? Yeah. It's jaywalking. Okay, so if they throw a cigarette on the ground, you can do it. And people do those petty arrests. You'll see them. So Freddie Gray being arrested for a spring-loaded pocket knife, you can't tell me that black people carry spring-assisted pocket knives at a greater ratio than white people do, that's, that's, or even Hispanics, because they're doing the construction sites around here. That's, that's a ridiculous thing to say. Of course we all have spring... I have a spring-assisted pocket knife. But conveniently, legally, there's an exception for police. Imagine that. So when you go and you look at the arrest records, what are you going to see? But the people here are carrying spring-assisted pocket knives at the same ratio as the people up there. So we're not focused on the crime of the spring-assisted pocket knife. We're focused on the crime of being black and poor. Listening to Mike talk, I found it depressingly easy to understand why distrust and hostility flow so freely between the police and the city and the communities they're supposed to be protecting. That us versus them mentality that Mike was talking about earlier, it gets reinforced and sharpened systematically, almost by design, and it poisons every interaction that cops in Baltimore have with the city's residents. Until the police figure out what the people who live here actually need from them, what it would take for officers to start improving people's lives instead of making them harder, sadder, less free, the anger and the fear that Mike Wood saw on the job are just going to persist. We're setting the stage and then going, oh my gosh, look at this stage. Well, yeah, we created it. 